June 1919 saw a rare royal visit to Leicester. The presence in the town of George V and Queen Mary was an immediate portent of the restoration of Leicester's status as a city. Meanwhile, a debt-laden fosse had gone into liquidation. The reconstructed club would take advantage of the new civic status and floated itself as Leicester City Football Club. Scotsman Peter Hodge was appointed manager and his initial team building was aimed at establishing the new club in a generally booming local sporting economy. Top quality fare invariably brought out the Leicester crowds as shown by the reception for the All Blacks at Welford Road and the touring Australians at Aylston Road. City were understandably inconsistent at second division level, but had a fine, profitable cup run, which ended in front of King George at Stamford Bridge. The following year, Filbert Street was graced with a new main stand and a new average attendance record of over 17,000 was set. How did we come? As thousands of people came in those days. We came on cycles because you had no fear of your cycle being nicked because all these people who lived in these terraced houses round about here stood on their footpath, the pavement outside their house on a Saturday afternoon or match day, and as you rode past, look after your bike for twopence, look after your bike, penny, look after your bike for twopence. And you got off and pushed your bike up the entry, left it there. There were probably 50 bikes, in the two, one entry, two gardens, 50 bikes. Lock the entry gate at the bottom, they're all perfectly safe. You were all right, as long as you remember which house you put it into when you came out. Anyway, we came to watch the match, and I remember coming in, I was a young kid, and uh, we were a bit late getting in, and we stood at the back and couldn't see. You see, in those days, you weren't seats, you got them in. Opened the gates and pushed, and they got there, you pushed them in. And we got in at the back, and I remember pulling a man's trousers, and we'd all in. Please, we can't see. What do you want? We can't see. Hey, these kids can't see. Pass them down. So we were picked up. And passed down over the top, and we sat down on the front, on the grass, <laughs> right there, so saw the, saw the match, great, great game. That season also saw a new record low attendance set. Played as a double header after a Manchester United fixture at Old Trafford, only 13 people paid to see the second part of the double bill between City and Stockport. After only missing promotion in 1923 on goal average, Peter Hodges' City took the second division championship in 1925. An 18-game unbeaten run featuring seven successive victories was largely responsible. The same season, the team reached the Cup quarterfinals once more, going out to a late Cardiff winner netted directly from a corner, the first goal so scored since the rules allowed it. City had a sensational forward line, dynamic Huey Adcock on the right wing, the left flank pairing of the muscular George Carr and the tricky Harold Wadsworth and the deadly combination of thoughtful schemer Johnny Duncan and the bull in a china shop goal scorer Arthur Chandler. In the 20s, football was a man's game, you know. You were about right size for a goalkeeper, and I'm Arthur Chandler, and if you caught that goal, you caught that ball three yards off the line, you finished up with the back of the bloody net, boy, and it was a goal for me. The football then was somewhere to go on Saturday afternoon to be entertained. And you, you, I'm not exaggerating, you could go to a match and the result could be one all draw. And you'd walk away and say, hey, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed it, damn good game that was. You wouldn't do it now, because somebody's got to win. A crowded treatment room often resulted from that style of football, but fun with electricity and artificial sunshine could be had there as well. It's a miracle any players were fit at all. Sometimes even the fans couldn't stomach the physical side of the game. This supporter fainted when George Carr broke his leg against Leeds and was revived by City players wielding the magic sponge. Hodge spent a record £3,300 on Manchester United's classy prompter, Arthur Lockhead, and a further £3,000 on Barnsley marksman Ernie Hine as the club looked to consolidate. Willie Orr replaced Hodge when he was spirited away by Manchester City. But the impetus was not lost. A hybrid draw was an early pointer to City's increasing acclimatisation to the top flight, and after seven games stood proudly at the head of the first division table for the first time ever. Even a drop to a final placing of seventh still represented a best-ever season. 
It was a boom time, and in 1927, Filbert Street saw the erection of its landmark double-decker stand. I mean, it was a good stand, that double-decker, you know, and the main stand was pretty good. But the popular side, you know, was very narrow. There used to be about half a dozen policemen. Never used to get any trouble. Never used to have any trouble at all. Not long after this game against Bolton came the remodelled ground's biggest test and its all-time biggest gate. 47,298 occupied every vantage point the ground offered, including the adventurous souls who scaled the Filbert Street end roof for a fifth-round FA Cup tie against Spurs. City finished third in 1927-28, five points behind the champions Everton, and a season later rose to runners-up spot in the table, just pipped to the title by Sheffield Wednesday. The campaign had started with this 1-1 draw at Old Trafford, and generally gave few signs of the excitements to come. But a city side steeped in experience and a fine mix of muscle and artistry was soon to burst into the headlines. Johnny Duncan would see his proud record of six goals in a game scored against Port Vale on Christmas Day 1924 equalled. Arthur Chandler against Portsmouth scored six goals in a match which Leicester won 10 nothing. Chani had scored five and there across the Sky came five beautiful swans uh, slipping away. And all the crowd said, Chani, oi, five swans, Chani, look, five, you scored five. See? Everybody cheered and clapped and so forth. I don't know how many minutes elapsed, a few minutes elapsed, when there was what I would call tail end Charlie, another an old one, you know, the last one left in line, came another swan coming along, <laughs> trying to catch up. And everybody saw, hey, there's another book up there, Chani, get it, score another one, Chani, score another one. And he did. So the five swans became six, and Chani's five goals became six goals. That's true. I was there. I saw it. He used to score goals, he did. That's all he could do. He couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't play football. But he used to get the goal. How he used to score, I don't know. Here we are, cop. Went up the wing, and he'd come, and he'd gradually keep coming in into the, towards the goal post. And he drew the... Goalkeeper out his position, and he just lobbed the ball to Chani. And Chani, you know that line in between the posts, he was standing on there. All he had to do was let it hit him. No, he tried to kick it, and now we're finished over the bar. That's stuff that I've never seen anything like every leg. Sepp Smith would star for City over the next 20 years. The youngest of seven brothers from the North East, he was the fifth to enter professional football. When it used to be the close season, you know, and they used to all come home. And they used to all bring a new ball with them. And they used to get me on the playing field next to the school and the, where I lived. And they used to coach me on that. Derby wanted me. And Portsmouth wanted to make, yeah. And uh, with my brother Jack and brother Billy, I played for Portsmouth, you see. And they, of course, they said, you're not coming to Portsmouth. I said, why? Well, he said, it's too far away from home. I said, that's all right. My brother Joe was at Leicester at the time. So I finished up the letter. City had not sustained their title challenge in 1930, but their creative linchpin was still acknowledged to be Johnny Duncan. But he took over the licence of the Turks' head pub in direct contravention of the club's rules and was therefore deemed to have terminated his own contract. They were also losing defensive consistency. The following season, goalkeeper Jim McLaren was beaten eight times by Grimsby and Jack Beebe let in seven against Arsenal. Team spirits were drooping, and typical was an incident involving BB in a punch-up with his teammate Billy Jackson. Mind you, McLaren, it has to be recorded, wasn't shy of throwing the odd punch. When they were attacking in the goal, and if somebody sent the ball across, you know, he would come out to punch it, punch the ball away, you know, and at the same time he would push the bloke in the, in the 
Buckle head or something like that. <laughs> yeah, you don't see him do that regular. Yeah. But at least Leicester now had a champion in the legitimate fight game, with local boxer Reggie Mean taking the British heavyweight crown at the Granby Halls. As City slumped, manager Willie Orr resigned, and just days after they'd been knocked out of the FA Cup in this tie at Newcastle, City confirmed the return of Peter Hodge. They were a smashing bloke, they were. Yeah. He used to come to me and say, Sep, how long since you've been at home? Oh, I say about six, six weeks or something like that. He says, right, you're going home next weekend. And that's what he used to do, pay up for fair and everything. The way he used to come and talk to you now, as if he's, you were his, his son, you know. He's the best manager I've ever played under. It was Hodge who cannily withdrew Sepp into the half-back line, playing just in front of long-serving skipper Adam Black. Another goalkeeping McLaren, Sandy of that ilk, was recruited during the second of two relegation dogfights, and the very real threat of a drop to Division 2 was narrowly avoided. City were now essentially a side whose key figures were ageing together, but their search for rejuvenating talent was a bit haphazard. For instance, their scout remained unimpressed by the young Stanley Matthews. Roger Haywood assumed the captaincy and led City on a cup run that took them within 90 minutes of Wembley. Young Archie Gardner was signed from Hearts and made a whirlwind impact with four goals on his debut at Portsmouth. But Pompey would prove sterner opposition on cup semi-final day at St Andrews. Well, my favourite memory is, is the semi-final at uh, Birmingham, you know, against Portsmouth. My mother comes into this. The reporters went to go see him, you know. They said to me, Mother, now, who do you want to win the cup? Jackie or Bill or Seth? She said, oh, I think we'll better get it over Jack and Bill. She said, they're all on him. He'll get his time a bit later on. What a crowd. Pompey will represent the South on the great day. Their four to one defeat of Leicester City pays the entrance fee to Wembley. It'll be their second final in five years. Weddell, Pompey's centre forward, who did the hat trick, shone brightly. He was all over the field, always popping up where Leicester least expected him. Portsmouth was the best side. We didn't play well. We were struggling all the time. In the event, Sepp would miss out on Wembley again some 15 years later, and within six months of the semi-final, Peter Hodge had tragically passed away. Arthur Lockhead was promoted from the playing ranks to succeed him. The club, however, would celebrate its Golden Jubilee season with a return to Division Two, missing survival by a single point. Welsh internationals Di Jones and Taffy O'Callaghan were among the new blood introduced in vain as the relegation scenario developed. Lockhead was replaced by Frank Womack, who turned fortunes round with one masterstroke signing. Jack Bowers, with 33 goals in only 27 games, he fired City, now skippered by Sepp Smith, to a remarkable championship win. People ask me who was the best footballer, I would say Sepp Smith. Well, Sepp was a ball player. It was unusual in those days to have ball players, you know, that could manipulate the ball. I remember seeing Sepp in the dressing room with his new boots, and he used to have big toes on them, toe tectors, you know. And he got, his, he got his boots on his feet and his socks in a bucket of water, hot water, softening the toes so he could feel the ball, you know. That's the type of player he was. He was a sort of, uh, oh, a Beckham type of player that you get today. And it was all surprising that Sepp only got one cap, one England cap. I always thought he was worth more. Football then, days, it used to be all attacking. Never used to rely on just defend so you still get a point, not sure whether they get a point, we used to go out to win, you know. It was more open but when we played. The setup was different, you know. 
You see, you've got the goalkeeper and you, then you've got the two full backs, that's the right and the left, right? And then you've got right half, centre half and left half. See, and then you've got the right winger, inside right, centre forward, inside left and outside left. And that's how they used to go, you see, they used to play that way. Leicester City took the field first at Stamford Bridge for their match against Chelsea and the home team gave a highly satisfactory account of themselves. They won their match by three goals to nil. And that's always a good thing to do on the home ground, because then the spectators know they're getting value for money. This was a brisk game, played in lovely sunshine. Now that winter is on the way, we seem to be getting a nice bit of summer. Three goals to nil was the sum total of victory by the white-shorted pensioners. Here comes one of them, a throw-in sent the ball to Mills, who headed past Goldie McLaren. City's reputation as a yo-yo club and that Chelsea defeat contributed to a typical cycle of two yearly spells in each division. City would start the 39-40 season in the second division, but wouldn't finish that set of fixtures for seven years.